Yes, I am well aware I've worn both this hoodie and the exact same hairstyle in a previous episode. Lizzie McGuire, you are an outfit repeater. Hey there guys, my name's Megan if you're new here and if not, welcome back for another spooky episode of Killer Weekend where each week we'll discuss a true crime case and you guys can feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments box below. If you like all things true crime, supernatural, UFO, conspiracy theory and all that good stuff in between then please hit that subscribe button. I'll be here for you each week with our true crime killer weekends and on and off every couple of Wednesdays with our weirdo Wednesdays where we'll discuss something spooky I've heard. If you would like to further support this wee channel on mine then please feel free to visit www.patreon.com forward slash Megan True Crime. I will leave a small disclaimer at the beginning of this episode. It does involve the death of a child and also the discussion of the troubles in Northern Ireland. If that's a trigger point for you, then please feel free to turn away now. Don't be coming at me in the comments because I don't have the mental capacity for it this week. Okay? Go make some tea. <laughs> Negativity. So my wee gremlins, I just wanted to let you know that this week's episode will have a little bit of a different dynamic, okay? You're getting serious Meg for a change because not only will we be discussing some really controversial issues, we will also be chatting about the disappearance and eventual death of a 14 year old boy. This one is a dark mystery that has left not only the residents of Northern Ireland searching for answers, but a single mother begging for your help. As law enforcement bury their head in the sands and life in Belfast goes on, I hope that this segment will have each and every one of you asking the question, why is no one talking about Noah Donahoe? Our story today takes us to the stunning city of Belfast, the capital of Northern Ireland and the place where the Titanic, yes, that one, was created. It's home to the famed beauty spot, the Giant's Causeway, but beneath its hardworking and scenic reputation, Belfast has had its fair share of sorrow too. When many of us here in the UK hear the words Northern Ireland, sadly, we think of the Troubles, a time beginning in the early 1960s when the country was divided into two groups, Catholic Nationalists and Protestant Unionists. The war between Northern Ireland Ireland's own people was rife and the streets of Belfast were no longer safe for anyone. Discrimination was pretty common unfortunately and a conflict of both religious and political beliefs tore apart not just workforces but friendships and families. Many people who lived in Northern Ireland at the time only prayed for respite so that they and their families could go on living in peace. And if you believe everything that Wikipedia tells you online, it seemed like they got that in the late 1990s. However, behind mainstream media, things weren't that simple. And even here in Scotland, the echo of violence could still be heard. I had my own personal memories with this. My aunt and uncle's home was painted all over the side of the house and the driveway with the words IRA at this time. I also remember being a little schoolgirl in 2001 and going home and switching on the TV at my nana's house only to see a bunch of little Catholic schoolgirls, not much younger than what I was at the time, running into school trying to avoid being hit with blast bombs, bricks, fireworks 
and possibly the most disgusting urine filled balloons. I'm sure a lot of us in the early 2000s watched on in horror as these little children were scared for their lives only because their school had been situated in a predominantly Protestant area. The violence escalated so badly around Holy Cross Primary School that they actually had to give the girls a military escort to get them into school. Now, I'm sure that these days, the majority of people living in Northern Ireland only want tranquility so that they can get on with their lives. But I would be extremely naive to say that the bitterness of the troubles isn't still alive and well in certain areas of Belfast today. I only mention this because I think in order to understand this case, you have to also understand the area in which it happened. 14 year old Noah Peter Donahoe was born on the 25th of November 2005 in Belfast in Northern Ireland. His mother Fiona, a wide eyed beauty with these wild blonde curls, was born in Straban County Tyrone on the borders of Northern Ireland. She had a fairly standard upbringing alongside her four siblings. Desperate to escape the small town life, she began studying in Southampton but soon realised that the student life wasn't really a good fit for her either, so she took a massive leap of faith. Moving to America to work as a nanny and eventually a carer for the elderly, this is where Fiona met Noah's biological father, a man named Emmanuel Diakpa. The two lovebirds met in Boston and Emmanuel, originally from Senegal in West Africa, instantly fell for Fiona's alluring smile. However, when Fiona found herself pregnant in early 2005, she realised she had a decision to make. All of her jobs up until this point had been merely cash in hand and without the proper citizenship, Fiona feared that her son, a mixed race male, would not have the same opportunities in the US as he would have back in his mother's home country of Northern Ireland. So before the birth of her first child, Fiona moved to Belfast and hoped to start a new life, just she and her son. However, settling into their new home wouldn't always be easy for the single mother. Sometimes some narrow-minded residents would see Fiona and her baby in the pram with their different complexions and without warning spew out racist hate. But 99% of the time, the little family led a happy existence and Fiona said that she and her son shared a rare bond, even calling him her soulmate. He shared everything with his mum. When the time came for Noah to attend school, Fiona realised quite quickly that her child was unusually gifted. Noah excelled at English and maths and pretty soon became quite an accomplished cello player. Noah, whilst attending the predominantly Catholic St Malachy's College, an all-boys school, discovered he had a love for sports. Specifically, basketball. He even began playing for a local team, the Peace Players, a non-denominational team who believed in bringing both Catholic and Protestant children together with the love of basketball. Noah was a proud team member and he began growing into the amazing young man his mother had always hoped he would be. As he grew up, his love for music only intensified and already being, you know, a pretty impressive cello player, he decided to try something new. Guitar, which is why when he received a stunning electric guitar for his Christmas, he was grinning from ear to ear and he couldn't put the thing down. He would spend spend all his days through winter break strumming away trying to find the right chords and probably giving his mum a headache in the process. I'm sure there's a lot of mums out there who can relate to that. You know, you get your kid a musical instrument for Christmas and quickly regret that purchase. Socially, Noah was a well-liked and popular wee boy 
but he was a sensitive soul and was never the loudest in a crowd. He'd even confided in his mum Fiona that he dreamed of being a doctor after leaving high school. I get the impression that a 14 year old Noah was wise beyond his years. His mum Fiona described him as an academic type personality and even at such a young age he had his eyes firmly set on a career in medicine, something he knew wouldn't be easy to achieve. Chief. He took part in several extracurricular activities after school to increase his chances of getting into a good university when school ended. This was also the motivation behind him taking part in the prestigious Duke of Edinburgh Award Programme. The Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme is an award that boys and girls can work towards by completing a series of outdoor activities. It's basically like like a wilderness challenge and was extremely popular with boys in the UK because one, we all know they love a physical challenge and a bit of competition and two, it looks amazing on a university application. Noah and his friends had signed up for the program in 2020 and they were steadily making their way through the list. However, then lockdown hit the UK and outdoor exploration was no longer an option. Noah, like most children, was clearly frustrated with the new stay-at-home restrictions, but ever the optimist, he decided to make the most of his time with online learning, he improved his guitar and cello skills, and would often watch a movie with his best friend, Mum Fiona. The new rules didn't stop Noah and his friends from socialising either. They soon downloaded the online server Discord and would video chat daily. Fiona would often walk by Noah's room and hear an eruption of laughter coming from behind the door. And these group of boys she would later name the Band of Brothers because of the dedication and loyalty they have shown Noah since his passing. No stranger to technology like most kids born after the year 2000, Noah was often in contact with his father Emmanuel via Skype whilst Emmanuel resided back in the US. Like any mum, I'm sure, during lockdown, Fiona was really gutted for Noah. He was spending a lot of his time indoors, but over the last few years, she'd become increasingly protective over him. Only a few doors down from where the Donahoes lived, a hostel named the Queen's Quarter Housing had opened up on University Street in Belfast. Locals were outraged. The inhabitants would vary from drug addicts to victims of abuse and some even with convictions of abuse of their own. Parents looked on in horror as drug dealing and drug abuse began taking place on their very own doorsteps. Many believing this was a weird move politically as there was a university, a secondary school and a children's play park all within walking distance from the hostel. Many protested to have the hostel removed, but their pleas fell on deaf ears and the hostel still stands to this very day. Fiona herself would even later admit that she was one of the parents who complained. She took Noah everywhere with her because she didn't feel safe having him out of her sight. In the summer of 2020, the UK took a sigh of relief. We could finally go outside. Lockdown restrictions were over and a 14 year old Noah wanted to take full advantage of this. On Sunday the 21st of June 2020, which is Father's Day here in the UK, Noah had asked his mum if he could go out and play with his friends outside. Now she was a wee bit reluctant at first because it was later in the afternoon and he hadn't even had his dinner yet, but Noah promised he would only be out for an hour or so and he would be back in time for tea. In a circumstance where Fiona would normally have said 
no, she relented. It had been so long since the boys were able to go out and socialise freely, so she watched on when at 5.41pm that evening, Noah donning his tie-dye blue and white sweatshirt, a pair of grey shorts, a pair of Nike trainers with a bright yellow tick and a khaki North Face jacket along with a khaki rucksack left the family home. Always a cautious wee boy, Noah put on his black biking helmet and rode off on his black Apollo mountain bike. This image will be etched into Fiona's mind forever as this is the last time she would ever see her son alive. The plan that evening was for Noah to meet up with a group of friends at Cave Hill Country Park to work on a group adventure as part of their Duke of Edinburgh award. But sadly, Noah would never arrive at the park that evening and his disappearance would rock the city of Belfast into a frenzy. At around 6.30pm that evening, Fiona began to get a little bit concerned. You see, she had told her son to text her when he arrived with his friends safely at the park, which he hadn't. This journey should have only taken Noah roughly about 40 to 50 minutes. And with that being said, Fiona called her son, but there was no answer. After two hours and still no response from Noah or his friends about his whereabouts, Fiona then called the PSNI, which is the police service in Northern Ireland. Initially, Noah's case is taken very seriously. Both local law enforcement and Fiona make appeals to the public for the young teen to return home. Because of the troubles in the late 20th century, Belfast remains as one of the most electronically monitored cities in the UK, with thousands of C CCTV cameras lining the city streets. The Donohoes and the PCNI are hopeful that Noah will be captured on those cameras. It is quickly determined after a review of the footage that Noah never went to Cave Hill Country Park. However, he has been captured on CCTV and his movements on the day he went missing are as follows. At 5.41, Noah leaves his home in South Belfast. At 5.42, he heads down a residential avenue on his way to Cave Hill as arranged. At 5.49, he's seen cycling along the city centre, still heading to Cave Hill on Victoria Square. At 5.53, he's seen on York Street near the university. At this point, Noah changes his course. He's no longer en route to Cave Hill and this takes Noah through a notoriously loyalist area, somewhere that is not safe for a Catholic mixed race boy to be at all. At 5.57, Noah is seen travelling through the city centre. At 5.57, Noah is seen travelling through the city centre, but the backpack containing his school books and his laptop is now gone. At this point in time, Noah seems to be looking over his shoulder and he's cycling quickly. Three minutes later at 6pm, a motorist sees Noah falling off of his bike and getting back on it quickly. Now, it is heavily suggested that during this fall, Noah did hit his head, but he is wearing his helmet and the motorist said that he got back on his bike and cycled away as if everything was fine. On the next segment of footage, Noah's jacket is suddenly gone. And then at 6.03, he is seen cycling furiously through the same street, but this time he is completely naked. It is important to mention that originally the timestamp on this footage was listed as 6.11pm, which would mean there was a nine minute gap in between Noah being seen without his jacket on and Noah being seen completely naked. However, this was later altered by the PSNI as merely an error on the original timestamp. The last sighting we have of Noah is when two residents claim to have seen Noah running towards the end of the street 
towards two men. Noah Donahoe was never seen alive again. Fiona, who was able to ID her son from the snippets of CCTV, said that he appeared exhausted and that he was constantly looking over his shoulder as he cycled. She needed answers and she was hopeful that the PSNI would get those for her, as the residents who claimed to have seen her son running nude through their street that day claimed that they believed it was merely a Father's Day prank. What was really eerie about the statements made by those two women was the fact that they were adamant they hadn't spoken about this to each other. They didn't know each other, but the statements they made were exactly the same verbatim. One of those very same witnesses claimed to have also miraculously found Noah's bike behind their car in their own driveway, which contradicted what many of the residents said as they believed that Noah's bike had been laying in the street. Police searched the residential area initially and found nothing of concern. However, certain aspects of this investigation would lead Fiona to have her own questions about how it was conducted. No door-to-door -door inquiries were performed and little to no formal interviews ever took place for those witnesses who claimed to have seen Noah running through the street that day. They would later claim that due to budget cuts, overtime requests had been denied and therefore their officers simply had to go home. A frustrated Fiona asked the PSNI why they hadn't been digging a little bit deeper. In a time of ring doorbell when someone's camera may have captured some crucial evidence. She is then told that if she wants more information she can appeal for it herself, which she does several times. During the initial search for Noah Donahoe, cadaver dogs were used to see if they could pick up a scent and also a local storm drain was checked to no avail. There seemed to be no trace of this 14 year old boy. Because of this, his mother grew more concerned and in turn more vocal on platforms such as Facebook and Twitter. The media coverage here in the UK was minimal at best and many believed that was because Noah was mixed raced. The area that Noah was last seen in in North Belfast is a place that locals claim no Catholic mixed race boy should ever be visiting. Because of the location he went missing and also the seemingly rehearsed eyewitness statements given by locals, many believed there was a sinister motive behind Noah's disappearance. That summer had already brought change and anger not only to Belfast but to the entire world when 46-year-old George Floyd was murdered on the streets of Minneapolis by police officer Derek Chauvin. In the summer of 2020, people publicly shunned the strict COVID rules in order to stand up for black people who have been continuously persecuted by law enforcement and racially motivated attacks. But whilst many took the knee in solidarity, a small minority of racists looked on in disgust. This disconnect led to change indeed, but it also led Led to a small few revealing their true colours. I'm sure we all saw on Instagram the hashtag Blue Lives Matter and White Lives Matter too. I'm smart, you're dumb. 2020 was a dangerous time for black people, and the north of Belfast was no exception. One main mystery in this case is Noah's state of undress. He's seen in one CCTV clip without his jacket, and the next clip completely naked, but he is never seen removing any of his clothes. The mobile phone that Noah was carrying with him that day that was brand new and fully charged had been discarded at a local children's play park, a 28 minute walk from where Noah was eventually found. His biking helmet was found only a three minute walk away from where locals claimed to have last seen him. Noah's hoodie and trainers were neatly placed on a wall at number 63 North 
Northwood Road. Possibly one of the most eeriest parts of this case is that Noah's green North Face jacket, his shorts and his underpants have never been found. But the item that causes the most controversy in this case would be Noah's khaki backpack, which contained his laptop and his school books with his name on them. Three days into the investigation, law enforcement received an anonymous tip regarding a man named Daryl Paul. Daryl Paul, a troubled 32-year-old man who resided on Glasgow Street only an 11-minute walk from where Noah was last seen, had over 190 convictions against his own name. The caller claimed that Daryl and a female friend had entered a cash converters, which is like a pawn shop, in order to sell the laptop and the other items in the backpack. As this was when Noah was still missing and his name was all over the local press, the clerk behind the counter took one look at the school books and turned them away. Then, Daryl tried to allegedly sell the backpack to an anonymous party goer at a house party in Belfast. However, when no one wanted to take him up on his offer, he became increasingly desperate to get rid of the bag and the contents. Is that because Noah's name was circulating in local press? The PSNI then searched the home of Daryl Paul, where they located the khaki rucksack belonging to Noah and his school books. The search for the Lenovo laptop led law enforcement to Daryl's female accomplice, and you'll never guess where she was living. She was staying at a room in the Queen's Quarter Hostel. Yes, the very same hostel that Fiona and the other local mums had complained about, only doors away from where Noah Donahoe resided with his mum. Both Daryl and his accomplice were arrested for the theft of Noah's items, but they were never charged in connection to Noah's disappearance. This is allegedly because Daryl was seen on CCTV footage that day miles away from where Noah was last seen. This is something that Fiona, understandably, is sceptical of because, as we mentioned before, there had already been issues with the timestamps on local CCTV. So how can they rule out this man who was found with her son's property using that same technology? During the agonising five days where Noah was missing, Fiona received an outpouring of public support. So many mothers could resonate with her situation. You know, her little boy goes out for a bike ride and then never comes home. From this love and support, Noah's Army was born, an organisation which vows to not only get justice for Noah, but to ensure that no mother has to ever receive the same ill treatment that Fiona Donahoe has. Of course, through her fear and doubt, Fiona had always prayed that Noah would return home safely. However, at 9.45am on the 27th of June 2020, it became all too clear that those prayers would remain unanswered. A second in-depth search of the storm drain on Northwood Road was carried out and unfortunately the deceased body of 14-year-old Noah Donahoe was then discovered, putting a tragic end to their six-day search. Fiona was broken and found comfort in her family, especially her sister Neve, who's been a never-ending support for her. Locals were outraged. Had this little boy been murdered in their beloved Belfast? And if so, what did this mean for the Troubles? Noah's father heard the news from America and instantly broke down. The past few years had been exceptionally hard for him, as in 2018, he had been a victim of a Boston shooting and narrowly survived. Law enforcement began to piece together a timeline of Noah's death. Now, quite quickly, they came back with the conclusion that there was no suspicion of foul play, 
quite a bold statement to make when the autopsy hadn't even been released yet. The PSNI began pushing the narrative that Noah had fallen off of his bike as the passing motorist had seen and he'd possibly hit his head, giving him a concussion which would explain the strange behaviour of stripping off his clothes, something which was later contradicted by the autopsy report. Noah had in fact died of drowning and there was no signs of swelling or any signs of a significant injury to Noah's head, merely a small graze on the side of his face. So did this seemingly healthy 14 year old little boy begin to act strangely and walk himself into a storm drain where he would later drown? Was there any history of mental illness or was he possibly on any type of medication? Noah's mother Fiona says no. There was no history of severe mental illness in their family, nor was Noah showing any signs of mental illness, and he was on no medication. So how do we explain this? What else could cause a young teenage boy to act? Suspiciously, drugs. But a clean toxicology report would soon thwart any of those claims. I mean, there are some toxins and sedatives that don't show up on toxicology reports, but I think we need to remember the kind of boy that Noah Donahoe was. He was an introvert, a quiet, good boy, an impressive cello player who had a great support system behind him. The friends that he ran with were also a group of like-minded little boys who were more focused on their academics than Friday night parties. A natural overachiever and the winner of the UK Maths Challenge and the Spirit of the College Award, Noah wasn't in any type of trouble prior to his death. I'm sure that most people to help them sleep at night would like to just chalk this up to maybe he got involved with the wrong crowd or maybe he suffered a mental break. But I hate to burst your bubble, that is not what happened here. This is not the kind of person that Noah Donahoe was and I think it's so important that we see that. Several suspicious factors have surrounded Noah's death and these are what keep Noah's army members up at night. The PSNI have never appealed to local residents or business owners for ring doorbell footage or additional CCTV footage to shed more light on what happened the day of his disappearance. Out of 180 plus CCTV cameras that line the journey Noah would have taken that day, only 22 of these have been recovered. During Noah's autopsy, the water taken from Noah's lungs was never compared to the water inside the drain he was found in. So we do not know that he was definitely not drowned elsewhere and then placed in the drain. Something that further supports this theory is the fact that only three days before Noah's body was discovered, the storm drain was actually searched thoroughly. They thought they did such a good job that they actually padlocked it on the way out. If his body wasn't in the storm drain at this time, it would also explain why cadaver dogs never picked up his scent. In the time since Noah's death, an anonymous tipster has gotten in touch with Fiona through her legal team and claimed that she, as a witness, saw four grown men attacking Noah in the city centre that day and that those four men are the ones responsible for Fiona's son's death. Another really odd factor in this case, as if you know there wasn't plenty already, is that the woman who claimed to have found Noah's bicycle in her driveway, her own back garden is where the storm drain is situated where Noah met his fate. So his bike was found in her driveway and he took his life in her back garden and she saw nothing. I also was thinking about this and I find it really hard to believe that on a day like Father's Day, where it's sunny outside in June, when a lot of the COVID restrictions were still in place, we couldn't socialize indoors with our family members, not one person on that road 
was out in their back garden having lunch with their dad, having lunch with their families. And for those who did see Noah that day, why did no one contact police? Why did no one approach him? If I saw a 14 year old boy running stark naked through my street, I would never just assume it was a father's day prank. Has anyone ever ran naked through their street as a Father's Day prank? It's been largely speculated that the PSNI did not do enough in those crucial days following Noah's disappearance and we have to ask ourselves why? Many believe that if a young Catholic mixed race boy was found murdered on the streets of North Belfast, this would lead to a flare up of anger and may even ignite the troubles again. There are currently three notorious files pertaining to Noah's case which have been kept private not only from us, the general public, but also from Noah's own family. And when the PSNI have been questioned on this and why we can't have access to those very files, they say it's in the interest of the public. The court case to have the contents of these files released to Noah's family unfortunately has been continued continuously delayed due to COVID restrictions. However, we're all hoping that whatever exists in these files is able to shed a little bit more light on what happened to that 14 year old boy. The superintendent Muir Clark has admitted that the case is extremely strange, but that he still believes there is no signs of foul play. And this disconnect between Fiona and the PSNI has long been brewing. When six months after her son was found dead, they had asked her for passwords to get into Noah's mobile phone and his laptop. Fiona would never have even known this had they not approached her directly for those passwords. The conflict appeared to have come to a head when in March 2021, Fiona and her sister Neve arranged a march in Noah's honour and they would take the route that Noah had taken that day. Many people walking in the march carried banners with Noah's name on them and also held pictures of Noah's face. And surprisingly enough, all 180 plus CCTV cameras captured this journey because pretty soon the PSNI were looking for Fiona and Neve in violation of strict COVID rules. They said the sisters had broken the law in order to hold a parade. But pretty soon after a lot of public outrage, they decided to dismiss the charges. It's been two years since Noah was found dead and sadly Fiona is no closer to the truth. Why was her son in that area? Why would he run and leave his bike in a stranger's driveway? Why was he looking over his shoulder in the CCTV footage? Was he running from someone? In an eerily similar attack, a young 15 year old boy who was just out riding his bike was assaulted by a group of men. This happened on May the 10th, 2020. Yes, only five and a half weeks before Noah disappeared. The young boy was savagely beaten in what was described as a hate crime on Limestone Road. This road is only a five minute drive from where Noah's body was found and only a 10 minute walk from where Noah allegedly fell off his bike. There's so many questions surrounding this case that just haven't been answered and whether it's intentional or accidental, the PSNI seem to have really dropped the ball on this one. Fiona Donahoe deserves to know what happened to her baby. No mum should feel like their child doesn't matter. Imagine how many people this really affects in the long run. Think about Noah's little school friends. How many of them do you think cry themselves to sleep every single night, wondering why Noah didn't just turn up at Cave Hill Country Park that day? If this case has been buried for the greater good, what stops another child like Noah from being taken? 
from the streets of Belfast. And who's going to speak for gorgeous little Noah if none of us will? If you have any, and I mean any, information, no matter how irrelevant it may seem to you, then please reach out to Fiona Donahoe via her legal team. I will leave the links in the description box below. This case really reminded me of the Reese Bonner case, which happened in my hometown of Glasgow. And I just can't shake the feeling that in both cases, there's some sort of cover up. I don't know why, it's just a feeling I personally have. What do you guys think? I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up for me. It really helps this wee channel that we're building. If you're watching for the first time and you'd like to see more true crime content from me, then please hit that subscribe button. I'll be here for you every weekend. If you would like to see more of what I do on my day-to-day -day basis, I'm pretty boring standard, then you can follow me, not home, on Instagram at Megan True Crime. I also have a little Twitter page at Megan True Crime. Basically the same thing. I love you all my wee gremlins and thank you so much for all your support behind the scenes. You make this channel possible. I love you all and remember, lock your doors, don't talk to strangers and also never stop asking the question, what happened to Noah Donahoe?